I returned from Syria 15 months ago, but I was there since, I was there for two years, since 2009, pretty much um, throughout, con consistently. So I was there for a year before the, um, the outbreak of demonstrations and then the, um, the military actions. And so I had a year to be among Syrians. I was working, I was teaching communications actually, and I was also uh, studying Arabic in two institutions. And so I saw the change in that two year period. And I was also, I uh, started visiting Syria in 1990. So I've been there eight or nine times during those years. A week ago in a talk in Seattle aired on, I believe it was alternative radio, I heard Jeremy Scahill speak about his work. As many of you recognize, Scahill is proving to be one of the most outstanding young journalists in the field. At the end of his talk, he admitted journalists can achieve little by reporting, exposing war policies and strategies. What he does believe is that we can have an important effect by bringing to our audiences the humanity of the people we do not know, especially those who are the targets of our country's aggression. And there are still many populations where we have absolutely no experience, that is the public, and very little knowledge. So I want to add to our equation of Syria what I know about some people I met in the TV industry, an industry that has, I will show, a great deal to do with the US-based hostility and war against Syria. This is a strategy that happens, well, this is a hostility that happens by design through destruction in armed conflict, but also through sanctions. And my t talk is titled Syrian TV Dramas and the War Agenda. Now, some of you may be smirking about this. What have S Syrian soaps to do with war and aggression and the internal politics of Syria? Before that, I want you to refer to my own productions on WBAI so that you can hear the voices of Syrians beyond the context of war and religious identity. Since 1989, as I said, until as recently as 2011, I've worked inside Syria with that aim to bring the humanity of others, our alleged enemies, to you. In my radio podcast archive, you can listen to interviews I made with Syrian radio producers, restoration activists, urban restoration activists, sociologists, novelists, fundraisers, students. So on my Radio Top Rear webpage, I just consulted recently, there are 11 programs in which I have, these are podcasts, uh, which I have interviews with these Syrians. Uh, and you can go to the webpage, go to the podcast, and then you'll see just click on Syria and you can consult those. And then I have occasional blogs on Syria also again on my webpage. Some of you know that I'm an anthropologist and this is partly in my capacity that I'm here as a speaker. I'll speak about what may seem a rather unprogressive, unsophisticated and plebeian subject, Syrian TV dramas, or as we call them here, soaps. For idle housewives, right? Well, in some ways, perhaps, but in Syria, as well as here in the United States, what people see on their home televisions, and 100% of Syrian homes have TVs, not insignificant. They also see the wars as reported from overseas on any international, through any international satellites, whether it's American or other Arab or French a language many Syrians over the age of 25 speak. TV drama is a major industry in Syria, employing thousands of the country's most creative and liberal people 
It's a significant factor in Syria's economy and has major social and political impacts on people's lives. You, of course, have heard about Syrian TV as a state-controlled institution. It is indeed state-controlled, and as such, much of it is not only boring, but also insulting to the intelligence. But with major investments from the Syrian government, from emerging private wealthy, a wealthy class in Syria that developed after the privatization, capitalization of Syria when it um, broke ties with the USSR. It had been very socialist uh, oriented economy until then. And from investments from foreign powers, mainly Gulf states, in the early 1990s or mid 1990s, a new industry of TV dramas developed. There is no significant film industry. There are a few filmmakers in Syria, but most of the talent and interest in that area goes into TV. The, this new TV uh, drama industry taps Syrian talent that normally go into films or go abroad. Well-known Syrian novelists, musicians, singers, actors starred in these and attracted many ambitious and talented youth. Names you may not know, but are well known to 300 million or more men and women across the Arab world. In the past eight or nine years only, most observers throughout the Middle East, those who know Arabic, will agree that Syrian TV dramas eclipsed that of the better known and long established respected Egyptian TV industry, which for decades dominated the industry and was and remains highly respected and prolific. The effect, however, of the Syrian TV dramas in, in um, eclipsing the Egyptian uh, was also to uh, create a new Arab consciousness uh, because the Syrian dialect, which is closer to the classical, established a new standard for spoken Arabic around the Arab-speaking world. And this, of course, involves 22 countries, from Morocco to Yemen. What am I getting at? Well, that Syrian TV dramas, whatever their subject, has an Arab nationalist impact. Arab nationalist. And that is something that threatens the United States, for some reason, I can't understand, maybe you can help me, and of course, more perhaps understandably affects uh, or threatens Israel. Features of Syrian TV drama, uh, these spread through 30-part series that played during the 30 days of the holy month of Ramadan. But they're not, the subjects are not at all related to religious identity or sentiment or values. So you had them produced initially in 30 episodes. Some, such as one you may know, Bab al-Hara, it's a post-colonial period drama, had extended now through six seasons and could be found on several channels of reruns as well. At their height in 2011, Syria was exporting 25 full series a year, carried over major satellite stations in Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, these are the main areas, and uh, Abu Dhabi, these are the uh, main locations of satellite uh, distribution centers. These employed thousands of technicians, many of I, I know, costume designers, researchers, the full array of production team you find anywhere in the world. Many of them are in fact government employees from state TV who moonlight in these private and lucrative productions. As a result, you often find very few of them at their home base at the Syrian TV center itself. A good proportion of these productions are family dramas come romances. Many are comedies, but they include political themes. Yes, political. 
not that the Syrian version of West Wing or FBI espionage stories, but historical. As one leading Syrian novelist told me, we can comment on the current state of our government, that is critically comment, by writing about a parallel situation from our history. And through that metaphor, we can get a message out. Syria excelled in its historical dramas. Note that I use the past tense now. As scholars pointed out, the sets are magnificently researched. Now, if you're watching a Civil War era or an early African-American uh, history film, you may not think about it, but in fact, the sets, the style of uh, the clothing, uh, the language, these are all things that you will look at critically and that will be part of your own historical identity. These historical dramas Syria excelled in and provided a new history, a new, not interpretation, well, I guess you could call it interpretation of Arab history, which were very, very widely uh, sought out and appreciated and commented on. I have sat with Syrians, or other Arabs actually, in other parts of the Arab world, watching these dramas and hearing them talk about the excellence of the language used that related to that period. And some of these people I was listening to were professors or historians or writers. Also the sets, the costumes. And this has developed a greater consciousness across the whole Arab world of their own historical and religious identity. Few other countries produced these in the quantity and quality that Syrian TV did. Syrian produced dramas also that featured conflicts between Israel and Arab countries and, of course, the struggle for Palestine. Some Syrian dramas were not notably critical of increasingly militant and fundamentalist Islam. One notable one, which was extremely popular, I think it, it was produced in 2010, is called Ma Malakat Aymanakum. It's one of the most popular Ramadan series in the past decade, which, which tackled, among other things, incest, male chauvinism, and most important, religious extremism. And I understand from a professor who herself, you know, ran home or made sure she was home at whatever time it aired, uh, very much appreciated it. She said there were many disputes publicly over this because one, uh, many of those who were uh, uh, some characters in the series uh, were refugees from Iraq who were depicted participating, involved in uh, prostitution rings. Uh, another uh, was the characterization of uh, some uh, chauvinistic, let's say, but mainly uh, there were religious groups who objected to the portrayal of religious extremism and the, one of the main characters in the series is a man who abused his sister and uh, was a, a extremist, a fundamentalist, and eventually became a militant. Uh, they tried to stop the Syrian government from airing this, and uh, they failed. The Syrian government decided to let it proceed. And you can actually watch it. I, I don't think it's translated into English, but I'll give you the reference to it. And you can also find a review of it in Middle East Online, which I can give you later. Such portrayals are not in the interest of either the US or Israel. Some years ago, you may know Hezbollah TV, El Manar, was banned from being broadcast in the US and Canada and I think parts of Europe. And they have been trying with some success also to ban uh, press TV here in the United States. Sarah can tell you more about that. Press TV is an English language, excellent news source from Iran. First, of course, the war has disrupted life 
and the economy in Syria. So the production of these dramas is almost impossible today. I've heard that one or two companies have re relocated in Beirut, but many of the technicians and writers and actors and singers and musicians have fled the country and are now involved in the industry, but produced from there and not at all uh, related to the themes that we once saw, the historical and other, they're located now, they're working because they need work in Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, Cairo. Um, but more important than this, transmission is now banned in the countries who provided uh, the distribution. For example, in June 2012, the Arab League, of which Syria was a founding member, officially asked the satellite operators of ArabSat and NileSat to stop broadcasting Syrian media, including Syria TV. And on September 2012, Syrian television channel broadcasts were broken off on those two that I mentioned, and Syrian drama TV broadcasts were stopped on Hotbird, that was in October 2012. So, politics, TV dramas, you can see what's going on there. And this is just one of a whole series of sanctions, whether they're conducted from here in the United States, through Europe, but also through American <coughs> pressure and influence in the Arab world. And what are Syrians watching today? Because with a war, you spend more time at home, if you have a home left. They're watching Turkish TV dramas, which are very good, but they don't have those political and historical uh, value that they're, they're translated into to Arabic. There are hundreds and hundreds of Syrians working as translators because Tur Syrian Arabic is, is selected as one of the closest to the classical and most widely understood and has is recognized of having high literary uh, value. So, you know perhaps what the role of Turkey is related to the United States policy on Syria. So that fits, and those mainly uh, romance dramas. Thank you very much. We can talk, of course, more about this. It's uh, we've still got uh, uh, time for. Sarah Flanders. I'll just introduce Sarah, who may not need an introduction, but uh, 